My father was a pedophile. I was one of his victims. And for most of my life, my self-esteem was as low as it could go. When I was a teenager, I used to stand behind sofas at parties so people could see only half of me. I cried a lot. I ate too much and I drank too much. And I felt guilty for everything that I did or anybody else did. I tried suicide and thankfully I didn't succeed. I have my husband and a lovely little blue pill to thank for my recovery. When my depression was diagnosed, I was in denial. I'm a Kiwi, we don't get depressed. But I had to face myself and I felt like a failure. Some days were very black. It would have been easier to have stayed in bed for hours on end rather than face the day. And I ate so much chocolate I should have turned brown. But depression is not something we can fix and it is not a stigma. It is an illness that can be cured. When I started to feel the gloom lifting and my abilities starting to bloom, the world felt different. And now that I'm healthy, everything is possible. In 1983, my husband and I pulled up our roots from our native New Zealand and moved to San Diego so he could work in the space program. I didn't have a work permit, so I volunteered all over the city. I also completed a diploma in speech and drama from an English college, extramurally and on my own, and after 26 years as a secretary, I opened Pris Communication and became a business owner. Now, that was a challenge for a start. But with the help of a business planning workshop and a great mentor, I soon learned the ropes. One of the first things my mentor said to me was, Jenny, I want you to imagine yourself in your office at the top of a 20-story building, and everyone in that building is working for you. That was powerful. That got me out of my PJs and into something more professional every day. <laughs> and he also told me, remember to pay yourself a decent salary and to be worthy of the money. These were two great business strategies. Mentors and money matter. Now, not long after I started my business, I became very ill and required a number of surgeries that ended our dream of having children. That was sad. I'd always thought I'd be a mom. Apparently, in the first grade, I used to mother all the kids. And when my sister had her first child when I was 13, I mothered her and the other three as well. But when I got past the pain, I stopped and thought, what if I'm not meant to be a mother? What if there's another path I should follow? Is there another destiny out there for me? To help me recover, I returned to the theater and the theater people I have always passionately loved. Now, I need to share this with you. Before I go on stage, I am petrified. The sweat pours down my back, my whole body shakes, and I can't remember any of my opening lines. But living inside another character for a few hours a week changed my perspectives. And it gave me a greater understanding of the nerves that my public speaking clients feel. When 9-11 struck, I was working in Seattle and I got stuck there for four days. That was the time to do a lot of thinking and a lot of yelling at the TV. And then I woke up. I thought, well, you can go on yelling or you can do something. I chose the latter, and when I returned to San Diego a month later, I'd gathered 20 women together, and we founded a nonprofit entitled Voices of Women, where we focused on peace through education led by women. We supported a girls' school in Kenya, another one in Cambodia, and refugee women in San Diego. After 15 years of operation, we all made the decision to close VOW. And within five months, another director and I had launched a podcast program called iVOW, where we interview women who are from marginalized communities or who really lead in male-dominated professions. 
I'm the host, I do the interviewing, and so far I've interviewed women peacemakers from around the globe, incarcerated women at Las Colinas detention facility outside San Diego, and female politicians who lead in San Diego and in the state of California. Michelle Obama is on my wish list. She would be the most fantastic interview. And of course I would ask her about her education initiatives and her health initiatives and her support of the military. But what I'd really want to know is, is Barack as sexy as he looks? <laughs> I'm about to turn 68, and people are always asking me, where do you get your energy from? Are you ever going to retire? And my answer is, well, I'm a late bloomer, and I've got to make up for a lot of lost time. <laughs> but that, of course, often makes me my own worst enemy. I work long hours, and I get very tired. I take on too much, and I panic. I'm a procrastinator, and I love leaving things to deadline. But what I have learned are two very important things about business, and that is that it requires discipline and focus. And the other thing I've discovered is that it needs thinking outside your brain. Now, I know that sounds a little strange, so let me give you an example to explain. When I'm at a meeting, I look around the table and I think, what would she do if she ran my business? What would he do if he ran my business? What's different about their thinking that I could use? Now, I still appreciate my own brain for its unique thinking. No one else on this earth thinks the way I do, creates the way I do, or dreams the way I do. And I love the fact that this little black pupil in the center, or the little black dot in the center of my eye is called the pupil. That means that it's always learning. Now, when I have a brain burst, I write it down. And if it's particularly good, I share it with other people because an idea shared gives it life. Those of us who know successful business people know this is what they do. They share ideas and they collaborate. So my eyes are the windows of my mind. They see in a way that no one else sees, and I choose to see the positive. Have you ever noticed that our eyes look just like the images we see of black holes in deep space? What's that all about? <laughs> my voice is the mirror of my mind. It comes from the depth of my being, and it says who I am and what I stand for. Do you know that scientists have estimated we've been using language for approximately 1.75 million years? That's a lot of talking over the centuries. And my husband would say that on some days I'm responsible for much of it. <laughs> I always remember that I hold up half the sky, thanks to Nicholas Kristof, and that I am made of the same atoms that stars are made of. I love going outside at night, looking up at those twinkling dots and thinking, hey, we're connected. <laughs> and when I'm really struggling with an issue, I like to moon travel. Now, if you haven't thought I'm weird up till now, I know I just created that <laughs> feeling in you. We all have our ways of solving our problems, and this is mine. I close my eyes and I leave planet Earth. I go and sit on a big old rock on the moon and I stare back at Earth. I try to find California, and that's a struggle. And then I try to find me, and that's impossible. So when I'm earthbound again, my problems are halved, and I have new perspectives. And that is the wonderful thing about our lives. I could sit on the top of Mount Everest. I could sit on an island. We have so many choices. That is the joy of our lives. I want to leave a legacy for women and girls to follow by sharing my experiences and my gifts. One gift out, two back. I want to be a role model for girls and leave them a legacy. You see, if you have children, you've already created a legacy, good or bad. You live on through them after you've gone. Well, I don't have kids, so I have to create my own legacy. 
and it better be a good one because it's all about me. <laughs> As a coach, I see women doubt themselves, their abilities, their aptitudes, and their awesomeness. Since I gained self-esteem and a sense of purpose, nothing can change my life for me. And I'm always reminded of Eleanor Roosevelt, who once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And as sure as hell, no one is getting mine. So life is very short. And if you don't believe me, think of a sequoia tree. The oldest in California is 2,700 years. Humans don't even come close. So when I'm getting all fussy about something, I think, will this matter in 100 years? And the answer, of course, is always obvious. Now, the other thing I like to do when I'm facing very big decisions is to sit my 95-year-old self down in front of me and ask her advice. What do you want me to do? And she, sassy woman that she is, says, well, Jenny, I want you to go and pour yourself a large glass of wine, and then I want you to take a long look at that sexy woman in the mirror, and I want you to tell her you're going out for ice cream and a swing in the park, and you'll decide later. <laughs> she does not want me to sweat the minutia. She wants me to live. I wanted to start looking after myself and to stop looking after other people all the time, so I started a business. I wanted to work with women and peace, so I founded a nonprofit. I got too busy to go on stage, so I became a theater critic and I now have my own review column. I wanted to help out in my community, so I chair the, the San Diego County Commission on the status of women. I don't want to run for politics, but I interview women who do. And I have flown in zero gravity, and I have plunged into the icy waters of the Antarctic, and one day I'm going to be on a show with Oprah, so look out, girl, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I've forgiven my father, and I've remembered always that his behavior was his problem and that was his life, not mine. So nowadays, no one and nothing can bring this girl down. The power and the purpose of me and my self-esteem are mine. I own them and everything I do. And I make the decision that there are no damned limits.